here in New York City. And this is artist therapy, where I take one of my favorite artists, or in this case, two favorite artists, mash them together, and try to suss out as much of the psychology and therapy that they can give us. And in this case, I'm taking Bruce Springsteen and John Steinbeck, one of my favorite writers, one of my favorite lyricists, putting them together. And in my life, I help tons of artists through time, go through a lot of their pain, a lot of their heartache, and help them use it in their art. And not just artists, any of my clients, <clears throat> but also myself. I am a client first, and I go through some deep, deep, dark moments in my life. I'd have actually say I'm, I'm going through one now. It's more existential. It's a little circumstantial, little of life circumstances. It's a little of like out of nowhere, it just hit me. And it's also a little of this, I have to let go of some things to move on to this next place. And it sucks. It feels like a profound morning. There's times when I just want to totally disengage. When I feel too much of a loyal to me, to my suffering, I want to wallow in it a bit. And at the same time, I just want to shed my skin and get out of it. That it is feeling like a death word march and the mystical stuff, the powerful breakthroughs aren't coming and might not come for a while. And when I'm in that moment, more than even my therapist, although I will go to my therapist, get a special call in, I go to music, I go to books, I go to those quotes that keep me going. And in my life, two of those characters, John Steinbeck and Bruce Springsteen, have given me a lot of ammunition to face the world with. Like I say, Bruce says, the greatest music in the world is there to help us face the world with. When we are in our funk, in our lowest of lows, we can be inflicted with a hidden shame that makes us not want to connect, not want to reach out. And it's the very time when we need to, but we feel like we are going to contaminate and be a terrorist to our friends and our family. It's a hard place to be. We are kind of soul stuck in that moment. And depression and isolation can suck the life out of us, take our vital energy. And so all I want to do in this next few episodes is keep our eye on the beautiful. Keep our eye on the characters in your life. It might not be Steinbeck or Springsteen, but it might be your favorite artists that prove to you they've been through suffering and they reveal it in their art so that you don't feel so alone. Steinbeck says this, there are those who go down, submerge into the common slow, and then rise more themselves than they were. If you can go down so low, you will be able to rise higher than you can conceive. And you will know a holy joy, a companionship, almost like that of the heavenly company of angels. But until you have gone way down, you can never know this. Rainer Marie Rilke says, for at bottom and just in the deepest and most important things, we are unutterably alone. And for one person to advise or even help another, a lot must happen. A lot must go well. A whole constellation of things must come right in order once to succeed. This is what our favorite artists do. They have some of that special concoction of important things that come together, that constellation of things that must go right to help us walk through it. And they can't push us faster than we're supposed to go, but they can give us that common language. They could tell us that they're on the same path we're on or have been on the same path we're on and that this won't last forever. That at some point <laughs> there will be a diffusing moment in which we start to shed some of that weight. The shroud gets lifted and something luminous starts to happen. But it might be a long period of time. 
And so great artists help us endure the sadness with greater confidence than the joys. They don't leave us alone in our woes. And they also, if they're good artists, don't let us relate and connect too much to the suffering so that we start to idealize the suffering or have too much of a loyalty to that suffering. Because they know that we can be ruled by our emotions, ruled by our mis misunderstood feelings, feelings of being condemned, isolated, unworthy. They will keep the eye on the beauty. We are, as humans, and just like the artists, so quick to toggle between joy and pain. Great art does that. Great art reveals, reveals, reveals. And what it reveals is cathodos and anodos, the downward movement and the upward movement, the death and being reborn, losing and being redeemed. Depression is a sudden destroyer of our ignorance and our naivety. It will bring us down to earth. It won't let us fly too high. But it gets us grounded and real. And it can often trigger the best creative moments in our life, creative inspiration that could come from nowhere else. We don't need to stay in it, though. Because I think the long-term successful artist learns how to deal with their pain. So I'm going to try to look at both John and Bruce, show you how they've dealt with a little bit of their pain, but also that it is just something for you to walk this journey with. When you're feeling weak and you're feeling scrubby and like there's a bear market of your life, that you have some companions and hopefully you get to look at your favorite artists in a different way as a source of medication. I'm going to look at two characters, one character from a story that Bruce Springsteen wrote, the streets of Philadelphia, the song. You can maybe imagine Tom Hanks here from the movie. And then there's another Tom, Tom Hamilton in East of Eden, Steinbeck's great train of a book, his greatest work in his mind. And to me, Tom Hamilton is my favorite character in fiction. It's one I most recognize in myself, the same characteristics. And I love Tom because, well, yeah, I love myself a little bit, but also I feel known when I read about Tom. And both characters come to a final end that is hard. Death. It's something we're always thinking about, whether we know it or not. And in this moment, I don't want to push you further into the darkness. Because these characters do die a death that is hard. But that we look to the artist who knew how to write about the characters. That the artists continue to live on. And we're giving, them these, giving us these characters to help us understand ourselves, not to help us go further into the darkness, but to give us some light. And we all know, I think, those of us who've experienced depression, or those of you who are coming here that haven't experienced much depression, but you are trying to understand somebody in your life who does, that one of the only things we want to be is known in those moments. We don't want the tips, we don't want the techniques, and I'm gonna try not to give those to you today. We are looking for the artists, the friends, the family who speak not to the pathology, but to the person. That they just get us and they let us be, but they're around us and they care for us and they say, I get it. And if we're just sinking too far into the depression, they slap us around and say, get the fuck out of that depression because you're, you're sinking too far and you're not using your resources. Now, I know that our depressions are all over the map from heavily medicated folks who have been suicidal and tried suicide to those who have things that come up from now and then just feel heavy. Depression can overtake us and people want to get us out of it. 
And like I said, maybe we just need to be understood in those moments. So I look to these two characters, these two Toms, Tom Hanks or myself in the character and Tom Ham Hamilton, also myself in the character. Jonathan Demme wrote Bruce one day as he was making his movie. And he said, I want a score that can play in a mall, <laughs> in a shopping mall. And Bruce said, I, I don't do scores well. I, I don't write for film well. I'll give it a try, but I can't promise anything. And he came up with this song, this beautiful song, Streets of Philadelphia, same name of the movie. And Larry Fink from Billboard said, Springsteen empathetically with his lyrics and performance zooms straight for the heart, traveling atop slow and sturdy, beautiful, pillowy synths. A powerful song with or without the image of the film to support it. It's a song about being helpless and having heavy heartache and being isolated. About, yes, death. The isolation of a man dying from AIDS, a gay man dying from AIDS, not only at the time of the movie dealing with the isolation of being a gay man, but dealing with the isolation of knowing he's on the verge of his death. Don't songs become the keys to unlock our heart? Because it's not overly prescriptive. It is overly relatable. Daniel Levitin, in his book, this is, your uh, this is Your Brain on Music, says, We allow them to control our emotions, to lift us up, to bring us down, to comfort us, to inspire us, the artists. We let them into our living rooms, and bedrooms, when no one else is around, when we're not communicating with anyone else in the world. We look to the artist. Here's the lyrics of Streets of Philadelphia. And maybe you can relate. Don't think of the Tom, don't think of the circumstances the character's in. Dying of AIDS is a gay man. Although, if that's where you're at, do so. Just think about the heartache that you've had or have. I was bruised and battered, I couldn't tell what I felt. I was unrecognizable to myself. I walked the avenues till my legs felt like stone. I heard the voices of friends vanished and gone. At night, I could hear the blood in my veins. It was just as black and whispering as the rain. It is a heavy, weighty song. But I'll say this, as Martin Luther did hundreds of years ago, the devil cannot bear singing. It's beautiful even in its death. It speaks to anodos, upcoming just as much as it speaks to cathedos, downgoing. Music is totally revelatory and gives us the full scope of life in three minutes. We can't forget the heavy moments when we're in the light moments and the light moments when we're in the heavy moments. We tend to, though. I know for me, yesterday, I just walked around the West Side Highway and there was tulips. It's spring now. I could hear the birds. And while I was dark and heavy and feeling super sad <laughs> and kind of lost existentially, those flowers and the birds were the total revelation of life, both anados and cathodos sitting together, as Steinbeck says right in the beginning of his book, East of Eden. And it never failed that during the dry years, the people forgot about the rich years. And during the wet years, they lost all memory of the dry years. It was always that way. Great artists speak to desire and burning passion and also psychological torture cruel punishment. They minister to both. To the gnarled parts and also the exalted, spiritually heavenly parts. 
And through their artistic sublimation, they take the unacceptable and transform it into something beautiful. Mature art is not self-pitying art. It's not indulgent, and it doesn't speak to victimhood. But it is still an an identifying piece of both death and life. It susses out our shit. And it's for the redemption's sake. So that we can bring something to the world. And that's the hardest thing about surviving depression, is knowing what can I bring? And we can't move to that too quick. Because then we won't walk through the journey we need to walk through and get rid of the old stuff and and cling to the new stuff. Charles Spurgeon an 1800s pastor, spoke deeply in England about anxiety, depression, confusion. Kind of revelational and revolutionary work back then for a pastor in England. To not be boring, but to speak to the heart's issue. And he says this, it is easy to sing when we can read the notes by daylight. But the skill for singer is he who can sing when there is not a ray of light to be read by, who sings from the heart and not from the book. You catch a particular isolation in some of the characters that Bruce sings about and John writes about. I'm going to move on here to John's character, Tom Hamilton. But I hope it gives you comfort that you have these characters. Rilke says, you must not be frightened if a sadness rises before you so large, larger than any you have ever seen. You must think that something is happening with you. That life has not forgotten you. That it holds you in its hands. It will not let you fail since you know that you are in the midst of transition. Streets of Philadelphia is a transitionary song, yes, to death, but also to enlightenment and the luminosity of the unlocatable for ourselves. Bruce gives us some location that we are amongst other sufferers. We are not alone. Let's move on to Tom Hamilton. Now, I told you that Tom Hamilton is one of my favorite characters in fiction because I relate so much to him. Not every part of him, but specifically the part that is big ego, but also big heart. Suffering, pain. Steinbeck says, Tom was a nice mixture of savagery and gentleness. I relate to that. He worked inhumanly, only to lose in effort his crushing impulses. Sometimes I relate to that. He got into a book, crawled and groveled between the covers, tumbled, tunneled like a mole among the thoughts, and came up with the book all over his face and hands. Maybe you relate to that also. That when we dig in deep to our favorite books, our favorite writers, our favorite musicians, we get them all up in our brain and in our heart, and we rub our faces all up in their stuff can't get enough. Steinbeck says, all great and precious things are lonely. And Tom Hamilton experienced loneliness. In a big family, he experienced loneliness. If you know anything about East of Eden, you know that the Hamilton family is based on John Steinbeck's maternal side of his family, his mother's family. And so Tom Hamilton would have been an uncle. And he is so adept at articulating how Tom moved in the world. I won't go too deep into how the story ends with Tom. But I will say this. I think the character of Tom is made very deliberately for the person who struggles with intense passion and desire. And often 
a lack of ability to target it pro appropriately. And when you have incredible amounts of desi desire and passion and personality, your ego is often huge. <laughs> Tom has all the egotism and self-love of a boy who thinks he's ugly. Mostly lets himself go fallow, but comes a celebration and he garlands himself like a maypole. And he glories like spring, spring flowers. It's as Bruce says, you've got to have egotism and empathy. He says, I have a voice and a point of view worth being heard. Heard by a whole world. Bruce also says, you got to have empathy. For it to be true, you have to have learned to empathize. That's the hard trick to pull off, he says. And in the character of Tom, we have that character who can both empathize and be bold, but also feels like a poser and feels fear at being great. Sam Hamilton, Tom's dad in the book, and also kind of the lighter version of Tom, perhaps more capable of dealing with his pain, says this, Tom is quavering over greatness. Shaking over greatness. So close. So close. He's enthusiastic, intense. His emotions are all over the place. He's sensitive. He dreams big. He's trying to decide whether he could take the cold responsibility, Steinbeck says, of greatness. And just like I think a lot of great leaders, greatness has a certain sense of that gentleness and savagery. Sam Hamilton talked about Tom's potential for violence. He's so close to being both this perfect place to land and be supported and often wanting to just rage out. My favorite, second favorite piece of fiction after chapter 13 in East of Eden, the first few chapters of, or the first few paragraphs of chapter 13 is this moment where Steinbeck celebrates Tom and explains Tom to us and the power of Tom and the potential of Tom. He was born in fury and lived in lightning. Tom came headlong into life. He was a giant in joy and enthusiasms. He didn't discover the world and its people. He created them. He lived in a world shining and fresh and uninspected as Eden on the sixth day. His mind plunged like a colt in happy pasture. And when later the world put up fences, he plunged against them. And when the final stock stockade surrounded him, he plunged right through it and out. And as he was capable of great joy, so did he harbor huge sorrow, so that when his dog died, the world ended. Can you relate a little bit? Or do you know someone who's like this, maybe a family member that you're trying to understand better? It is hard to corral these folks. They mostly need to be understood and mirrored. Mirror back to them what, you're, what they're saying. Because they already wrestle with so much in their head. They are already brooding fire, as Steinbeck calls Tom. They already have wild exploring mile, minds. Tom bruised himself on the world and licked his cuts. He experienced life. There's only so much you can tell him. But if you have the right words and the right tone and the right reflection and mirroring, a Tom in this world can hear you and maybe you relate. Maybe you have to tell the people in your life, this is who I am. I just need you to understand it. And when I'm in my pain, I just want you to be there and get me. Because maybe you're a big dreamer. Maybe you're daring. Maybe you're excessive. But often, like Tom, that potential can go to waste. 
because we don't have the right characters guiding us and we don't have the right tools. It's a thoughtful character. A little bit introverted, a little bit extroverted. Loneliness haunts him, but he's curious and contemplative and complex. And those kind of characters need the right artists, friends, family to bounce ideas off of and be understood. Now, what I want to do now is switch gears and we're going to use Tom as a jump off point to a book that has been powerful in my life and try to understand how some of this can be used. Some of this darkness and mental illness can be used and harnessed as Steinbeck and Bruce are doing for us right now. Author Nasir Gemi, and I hope I'm saying that right, is the director of mood disorders at Tufts Medical Center. And he wrote a book called A First Rate Madness. And what he's suggesting is that mental health and mental illness and leadership are often very uh, powerfully intertwined. That some of the best crisis leaders in history, if not all of the great crisis leaders in history, had mental illness of some sort, whether it was depression, mania, bipolar, some kind of probably diagnosable disorder that help them be more realistic, more empathetic, but also make decisions that were very tough for the greater good. He wanted to uncover the links between leadership and mental illness that psychological health, healthy people tend to be more unrealistic. Their heads are too far in the clouds, they haven't suffered enough. And what he said is that many of the great leaders have depressive realism. That depressive, depressives won't sacrifice realism for happiness. Now, if you've had too much hardship or too little hardship, you don't tend to fit into that leadership category. It kind of takes the right amount. And when I look at Tom, Tom Hamilton, he almost had the perfect concoction of being this great leader. Just the right amount of depression and mania egotism and gentleness, savagery and compassion. In Martin Luther King's sermon, he says that change comes from a creative maladjustment of a non-conforming minority. Let me say that again. A creative maladjustment of a non-conforming minority the creatively maladjusted. You have to be a little off, he's suggesting. That, as Bruce says, you have to have chaos, tumult, disastrous relationships, humiliation at a young age, feel an enormous amount of weakness and things start to burn, burn, burn. And if you take that flame and aim it towards the right thing, it's a powerful weapon. Aristotle says, why is it that all those who have become above average, either in philosophy, politics, poetry, or the arts, seem to be melancholy, and some to such an extent that they even are seized by a disease of black bile. All right, he was writing 2000, more than 2,000 years ago. I don't know, we don't use black bile as a common uh, mental health issue today. But he and Bruce and Martin Luther King Junior are expressing that some of the ugly suffering we go through will minister to others. When incubated, the tragic becomes powerful. The frighteningly complicated in our own lives becomes very sharp and acute and synthesized for others. The unlocatable pain that we're trying to get through when finally we work through some of it, we come out with a realism and a powerful ability to recoup the world and cooperate. And
and make tough decisions on the behalf of the greater good. What we're haunted by can actually be a solve and a salve to others. Those who are sometimes on the precipice of an insane insane asylum can also be the best leaders we've ever had. Depression, if we are not marginalized or an outsider at some level, as Bruce says, we have the ability to not reach folks. I'd say in my own life as a therapist that my marginalization my outsiderness at times in my life, my depression, is the very thing that helps me understand and have compassion for my clients. Now, if you were like me, some of this depression is very causal. Something happened. There's a circumstance. Some of it is existential. It's a transition in life into a greater sense of knowingness. And so we have to leave the old behind and it's really painful to let it go. And some of this stuff comes out of nowhere. Like it did in the life of Tom Hamilton and Bruce and John. Here's what Bruce and John say about their own lives. Bruce says this, it comes in darkness or in broad daylight, each time wearing a subtly different mask. So subtle that some like myself who have fought it and named it multiple times, welcome it in in like an old friend. It takes up a deep residence in my mind and heart and soul. He says in his 60s, especially the ages of 60 to 62, and then later, 63 to 64, he had a little break in there. That I was crushed. I felt myself dangerously slipping away. I became a stranger in a borrowed and disagreeable body and mind. Steinbeck says this, I do get the horrors every now now and then. Comes on like a cold wind. There it is, just a matter of weathering it. Alcohol doesn't help that a bit. I usually go into the garden and work hard. Says as a child, I can remember desolating sadness when I was a child. Worse probably than I have ever had in my life because they came on like a black void. There was no reason for them. Things that were black were black indeed. And things that were white were blinding. The world has always been in the process of decay and birth, Steinbeck says. Night and day, cathodos and anodos. I want you to understand in this particular part of the episode that the down falling moments. When we fall down, we are often falling upward. When we get the right resources and the right help, we find those right voices to be alongside of us. We can be more powerful than we could ever know. And I'm struggling with that right now. I feel stuck. I don't have the answers. Just want to get the fuck out of this. Feel rootless. Times I feel ruthless to myself feel inconsistent, just like Bruce's character in Streets of Philadelphia, unrecognizable to myself at times. Feels deadly serious. And the substructures inside of me do not feel stable. Even as I breathe and get in touch with it, I know it's going to last. As much prayer and moaning as I could put out into the world, it's going to last a bit longer. Something's working itself out in me. And I have to trust the histories of the Johns and the Bruces and the Toms and my own history. Of seeing some light at the end of the tunnel and being more present, powerful, great, not just quavering over greatness, but entering into it and owning it. I'm going to close us out with some 
hopefully hopeful words, but I hope that you've been able to use Bruce, John, and the Toms to just feel known and accepted in your brokenness and to know that this too shall pass. And I don't believe that right now. I know it sounds like bullshit when you're in it. But there will be rest and peace, and we will come out with more knowledge if we dig the right way for our heart to be unlocked but more than it is now. There are so many stories of artists who've just lost it in their depression and in their darkness. Sometimes maybe clung to it too much, fixated and attached to it. Sometimes the chemical balance inside of them was just not going to work right. The solutions couldn't be found. But even Aristotle, a couple thousand years ago, was saying that mental health issues and greatness are so closely interwoven. That we want to be, remain free and individual and self-contained, but we are disrupted by brokenness. And those disruptions actually take us to the next plane of awareness, empathy, compassion, and greatness. When Bruce won the Oscar for the streets of Philadelphia, his dad, who he had a tough relationship with and didn't feel understood by, said, I'll never tell anybody what to do ever again. Because he had told his son at a young age that he couldn't be a musician and he shouldn't go down that path. Get a regular job. Folks with depressive experiences tend to be, like I said, realistic, potent. Just before and after episodes specifically of depression. Asir Gami says this again about resilience. Resilience is created and nurtured often in these depressive places where we weather the storm, we hold out, we hold on, we wait. We have a train track resilience and he calls it the mind's vaccine. Exposed to tiny amounts of the virus the body mounts an immune response. When it's infected later, we are prepared for that infection. We kill it off. And so hopefully, some of our experience with depression actually be, gives us a resilience and an awareness of its length and its power that it will end and that we are given access to a defiant part of our voice that we fight for for years and years and years that holds out a bit of optimism, purpose, and confidence. Oh, it'll come. Like Steinbeck says, I've been feeling lousy in my mind, but today there's some break in the clouds and maybe the darkness will go away. It has been a period of blue despair, such as I haven't had in quite a long time. I don't know what it is, but it's based on, and maybe it isn't over, but I too feel better today. Such things are very serious. He was in his mid forties, near exactly the age I am. He just turned 43 last week. And on that birthday was one of the hardest depressive states I've been in in a long time. And it remains today. And I think about that song by Bruce. I'm waiting on a sunny day. <laughs> waiting for the clouds to break. But it wasn't far after Steinbeck wrote those words to a friend that he wrote East of Eden. And again, one of Bruce's most powerful and beautiful songs comes out of an awareness in his own life of pain. Musicians, artists, writers, they ride on the same train we do. <laughs> the ones that we really give a shit about. They're in the same lane, they're the same path. We share a common language even though we look different and we sound different. 
and our experiences are different. We have these occasions of overlapping connection. We also, though, need to get the support. And here is my plea to you. If you are dealing with a family member who is often depressive and you are constantly trying to fix them, figure them out, maybe you're the one who actually needs some help. So I'm going to recommend you find some support from a trusted and wise character who doesn't have simple answers and techniques propositions to deal with this person. If you in your own life are suffering right now and you aren't getting the help or you aren't reaching out to someone close to you, I, I beg you to do so. I did so this weekend. I just stayed at a friend's house with his family and his kids just to be around some lightness and joy and some people who just got me and we played some board games. John writes his friend, Bo Besco, who was going through a hard time. And he says, I had always thought that a man should handle his own punishments, but there are some things you can't handle yourself. I know that now. One might as truly say he could remove his own appendix. It is an outsized ego that refuses help. I know because I have or had such a pride. Myself, too. I'm a therapist. I do this for a living. I have to see clients today. I saw clients yesterday. I'm going to see clients tomorrow. Now I'm in my own funk. It requires me to go get the help so that I can be as sharp as possible for those people, even when I'm in my pain. It is this relationship and communication with pain that makes things beautiful on the other side, that great work, and often the work we do inside it. I actually feel like with my clients right now, I'm probably more compassionate, empathetic, and sharp. I don't want to stay in the place I'm at. But when you have a deep relationship with your grief, it does seem like that is where the most beautiful art comes from. So that's my plea to you. One, I hope you just got inspired and not taken into a dark vortex of uh, scrubby corners, but that some of my passion to connect to my favorite artist is going to get on your skin and you're going to reach for your favorite artist. Just be connected. So next episode is also going to be on isolation and depression and what we can do with it, how we can move the world with it. I appreciate you spending time. I know this was a slow moving train today. Just chugging along inch by inch. And if you made it this long, I commend you. And I hope that you got to spend some time with Steinbeck and Bruce today in a good way. And myself, subscribe if you can. Hit that little ringer that says when the new episodes are coming out. And as I always say at the end of these, in the famous words of Rainer Marie Rilke, and so true to today's session, everything is yet to be done. Everything. And written on my favorite bench in a park nearby, from here we go everywhere. Have a great day, guys. Work through the pain well, suffer well, and you will be rewarded. Blessed are those who mourn. Amen.